Hi, I'm Meredith McMath with Run Rabbit Run Theater, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about costuming and why I think it's so crucial to a characterization that an actor is portraying. And I've uh, just uh, skipping my past. I just uh, have often wound up directing shows that I also happen to be doing the costumes for. And so wanted to run through some of them for you. Um, Midsummer Night's Dream is a great one to start with. We did an outdoor production of A Midsummer Night's Dream a couple of years ago. And what we have here is the Puck costume, particularly spectacular. Because the, because the idea is to create a costume that brings to life the character for the audience, He's half goat, and we wanted to create a character costume that made it feel like a goat. It was great for the actor, though, because they went further with it. They wanted to walk like a goat. So the young man here who portrayed Puck gave me a pair of old sneakers that he had, which are right down here, and an old pair of pants that he had, and we stuffed out the fur over top of the pants with some pretend muscle for the goat at the front and the back. And then we Velcroed the fur right around the base of that heel of the sneaker. We drew a line down the front sneaker to look like goat hooves. And he really did walk like a goat during the entire show. In fact, he, um, he never did put his weight on the back of his heel. So it helped him to have a crazy costume like this. It helped the audience who laughed every time he showed up on, on the scene. And uh, <clears throat> he was also interacting with fairies. This, is, this was my choice of fairy. I like to place this in ancient Greece, uh, this go round. I've seen it done, Midsummer Night's Dream been done in every era you could imagine. But for me, it was great fun to do it in Greece. And these are the fairy-like characters with overabundant hair and flowers and um, a soft, I really was looking at, uh, thinking about a flower petal, and that's why I chose those. And of course, you also take the information from the script itself, so their names is very and names are very important. So here's our puck character, and she's a professional actress now, by the way, Susie Alton and uh, Garrett works professional sound. Garrett Millage down in Richmond. They, um, as we get into the show, puck was then. Uh, doing things like going up a tree, watching Demetrius and Lysander start their fight. The reason he's up in the tree is that he's watching this. He's thoroughly enjoying the fight. And this is also part of costuming. Uh, you didn't have popcorn to watch a show in ancient Greece, but you would have grapes readily available. And so he got up in the tree to watch, and he actually had a bunch of grapes with him that he could eat during this presentation. So these two, the red and blue contrast was to help you understand uh, the, the uh, anger between the two, right? And they're armed to the hilt and they're about to duke it out. All right, so what about the girls? Well, what we did for them is they're in very flowy robes, which is great because they're getting chased all the time or chasing others. And so you get that movement in their gowns and the audience is in the emotion with you at that moment. It helped them too. Uh, and you might notice that I put two actors in blue and two in red. I wanted to color code the lovers because it helps the audience figure out the play. Not like everybody gets Shakespeare right off the bat as they hear it spoken. So it worked well to have this contrast so the audience could enjoy the uh, process kind of figuring knowing where it was going to wind up but in the beginning when they are chasing each other around and the person has the wrong the wrong guy we know <laughs> she's in a blue outfit and he's in red um <clears throat> that's a midsummer's for the lovers part now let's look again at the fairies beautiful outdoor production of this um i went with a very delicate floral look as she is as as I mentioned and here's our donkey uh, turn donkey for a moment this little character I had be Cupid now Cupid is mentioned in the script 
and I thought it might be fun to have Cupid in there with a bow and arrow to show that uh, the lad creates quite a bit of problems for the romant romantic couples and confuses things for them all the time. So we use that in the script. So <clears throat> in contrast, Oberon uh, was a large, uh, powerful force. And Titania is this delicate flower who uh, gets angry very easily. So your own interpretation of the character is going to tell you where to go with costumes. And <clears throat> costumes can be done according to the play. Costumes can also be uh, taken and run with by the director who decides on a certain version. When I saw Midsummer in Washington, D.C. several years ago, uh, Michael Kahn, the director, had the fairies be miners. And they all came up from the ground and had miners' helmets with uh, lamps on their heads. Uh, and Oberon came up from the ground, um, in big contrast to the, to the female fairy life so a, that is usually existing, like mine. Um, so any iteration is great. So what do you make costumes with, right? Besides fabric, there's a lot of options out there. And uh, you should play with it. Costumes should always be taken and made from any material anybody wants. So uh, for Midsummer, it's just a grand finale here. <clears throat> we were thinking about what ancient Greece had to make things like a wall. Uh, he's obviously, as an actor uh, in this scene, he is really unhappy to have to be a wall. But we created something that looked like it could have been put together with tree limbs and then done with uh, fabric of the time. All right, there's the lovers, finally with the right people back there. Oh, but there's so many other things that we can do with costumes. We can stack costumes with wire. This is a very uppity character named Lady Bracknell for the importance of, from the importance of being earnest. And she thinks very highly of herself, and her hat goes with her. Uh, this was all a very lightweight wire structure, so the hat didn't fall off her head. It helps the audience realize She's a very snooty character. Conversely, you can put a costume on somebody that shows how flattened they are by life. And this is uh, the woman who plays Eliza Doolittle in Pygmalion. And uh, she's feeling as squashed as her hat. Then we've got, uh, let's see, contrast and personalities. We're going to get to other structures that we can create. Uh, this is a very, very well-bred young gentleman. Same guy who played Puck, by the way. In contrast to his, uh, to his friend, who is a real uh, ne'er-do-well, and so he's wearing very relaxed pants and stripes to show he's a bit of a, a rogue, and uh, it gives a good contrast for the audience who are trying to weigh the differences between these two fellas. All right, so where else do we want to go? All right, last one before I start talking about PVC pipe structure. Uh, this... I directed a loud New York opera production of Mary Widow, and it's supposed to be set in the uh, restaurant called Maxime's where the can-can dancers would be. Um, and so the scene is of can-can dancers. And what I did was take the actual image from the time of Maxime's back there, and I made sure they were wearing black stockings and high heels and incredibly fluffy uh, petticoats and then they're wearing hats, which I don't really want to have to make them wear during a can-can dance, but I could go with the feathers. And then it's a very joyful, exuberant, bright scene. So even though those look like white petticoats up there, we brought in the contrast, uh, contrasting colors and made the audience just cheer up the second they saw these folks. So costume's vital. Uh, a lot of other things you can do with costumes. You can make a waist appear smaller by painting uh, and, and actually fading in the colors on, a, on an outfit. People paint costumes all the time. Uh, you can create outrageous headgear, as I've already mentioned. Um, you can create, you can have people not be human, obviously. And one of the things I wanted to bring up was what we did in the 39 Steps. 39 Steps is one of the most play, fun plays I've ever done. And uh, this flock of sheep is actually a crew member, Caitlin DeLitta, who had a PVC pipe structure on her back. 
And then all of these sheep, the sheep that we created from sheepskin, and uh, hanging down is PVC pipe legs and bells around their necks. And as she walked, it really did look like a flock of sheep. And that's in the script, but no one ever really bothers to make the flock. You just hear sheep. So it was just too much fun to do. We just had to do it. All right, so that gives you an idea of where you can go with things. Um, yeah, lastly, may as well mention this. Creating character through um, costume includes things like making sure bad guys look like bad guys. You can put scars on their faces with makeup. Uh, you can have an actor shave their head. They're always willing. And in this case, you give them a costume that makes them look crazy and dangerous. Uh, you've got sunglasses in the middle of the night, so that's a little unusual. You've got him wearing leather gloves with a, a fake pistol in his hand. That tells you he is about to kill you, actually. Um, and at the same time, he's very elegant. The, the character speaks in an elegant manner, so he's wearing a lovely dinner jacket. Um, it's ominous, and it really works for the scene, I can tell you. So <clears throat> you're picking costume items from the script. You're picking costume items the director might suggest that aren't in the script. And then you have to make sure that the actor themselves are comfortable. Um, Lady Bracknell's hat that's so tall, that's got to work on her head so it doesn't fall off. Um, when I'm asking somebody to wear a corset, we have to make sure they are willing to admit when they can't breathe. That's important. Um, so, last example I want to give is from our wonderful show, Once Upon a Christmas Carol. Most people are familiar with Christmas Carol, and uh, this is our version, a musical version we wrote um, called Once Upon a Christmas Carol that we're going to do this fall at Franklin Park Arts Center. Uh, and my friend Diane Alshafai, who played Lady Bracknell in that picture, uh, is a music composer. She composed the music. My friend uh, Karma Jones did the accompaniment music, accompaniment, and I did uh, this adaptation uh, from the book uh, by Charles Dickens. So when we did the show, I had choice as writer-director to develop the characters in different ways. And what I decided to do for the Ghost of Christmas past, present, and future is have there be a contrast. The, the past is supposed to be like a candlelight, a small candlelight. Ghost of Christmas present is supposed to be full of life, very exuberant. And the Ghost of Christmas future, my choice was to make him huge um, and very dark. We had a huge stage to work from. It was actually two levels. Um, They're up on the second level of this. And so I wanted to fill that space. So the Ghost of Christmas Past came out and all you could see in the room was this image that looked like a candle as she walked out. She's a young girl and her head um, is lit with one of those great battery-operated lights uh, systems that could actually be hanging. It hung from the back of her, of her very tight crown so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't move. And so, and we also created wire mesh flames up around here. And that light in the dark, that light actually lit up the uh, metal. It's a lot of fun to come up with the construction of these things. And then you have to test it in space to make sure it's doing what you want it to do. In her case, you had to go to a darkened room to make sure this candle effect was happening. And so there's Scrooge starting to think about his past and starting to regret things, right? So then for the ghost of Christmas present, we had to create a very joyful character. He scares the heck out of Scrooge when he comes on stage. And he's just larger than life. And in actuality, the fellow who played this part, Sean Malone, uh, is much taller than Phil Erickson, who played Scrooge. And he just had a, a blast um, waking him up to <laughs> just scare the heck out of him. In a big, booming voice, he then brings him over uh, here and shows him what the uh, present looks like and how much fun everybody's having, except Ebenezer Scrooge. So again, a larger character We've started with a small, young girl, larger character, and now we go to the Ghost of Christmas Future. Ooh, ooh, ooh. ooh do we have fun with this one. This actually brought a gasp from the audience. Um, it looked real, and it was terrifying. It was wonderful. This is our Ghost of Christmas Future. 
This is how short Scrooge is compared. He's standing. And this is how huge, uh, let's, say, let's say here, 6 foot, 12 foot, 15 foot tall goes to Christmas Future. And this was a huge uh, width. I think the ghost's width was about 10 feet wide. Um, we had a huge skull um, there in the, the, um, underneath the robe. And the arms could outstretch on either side, and they did, to make it look like an actual moving care a real character. You wanted the audience to wonder how they had how the heck these people got a 25-foot actor to play this role. So how did we do it? Oh, that's the fun part. He did have glowing eyes. We had uh, lighting back there. And now, remember Demetrius from the images I showed you? That's my nephew, Lee Bean, who's a fine actor. Lee was in Christmas Carol, and this is what we had him do. Lee is six foot seven, and we actually constructed through PVC pipe the skull that has lighting in it, and these wrapped poles. We constructed a push system so that he could have the arms actually stretch and point with a skeletal figure uh, finger to where um, Scrooge needed to look into the future and and deal with himself, <laughs> change. So um, this worked incredibly well. We just had this huge draping, uh, you know, uh, cloak over him. And uh, by George, it worked and scared the audience as well as Scrooge. It was just marvelous. Uh, costuming is crucial. You want to have the actors be very pleased with what they're wearing, make sure they're comfortable with it. You have to make sure the audience is totally immersed in the feeling of the moment, the emotion, which can also come through in those costumes. And you have to have them walk out of that theater knowing they've had a completely amazing experience that took them somewhere else uh, before they returned to Earth. So yes, your costuming choices are crucial. And uh, if you have costumes in your future, I hope you enjoy making them as much as we do. Thanks.